This is G Free Radio. Here's your host, Peter Stewart. G Free Radio Show, episode 57, with me, Peter Stewart. So, last week we celebrated the little guys, the small cafe owners, cooks, and innovators who help keep the G Free grassroots going. This week, some of the biggest players in the business. First, Heinz, more than 140 years old. Last year it was sold for $23 billion. In 2011, it was the UK's most highly rated food brand. Now they've got a toehold in the gluten-free market with a range of pastas and pasta sauces. Here, what's led them to that decision? After all, the only pasta they've done up till now has been cooked in tins with a tomato sauce. And also, where they're likely to go next down the G-free road. Plus, Nans, the big name in oats in the UK, with the special G-free range of uncontaminated oats. Catch our interview with them and learn so much more than just about their product range. On the way, the Nans health expert with lots of tips on why it's so important to get your oats. Plus, when should someone get tested for celiac disease? There are certain groups of people who are already in doctors' waiting rooms in which signs of CD are much more prevalent, we give you the gastroenterologist's top four red flag patients. There's new guidance to support children in English schools who have celiac disease. We take a look at what problems children face, what teachers will be obliged to do, and the reaction from the Celiac UK group. Plus, caterers are being urged to increase their gluten-free offerings. We talk about gluten-free rice noodles, our tweets of the week... And we return to the G-Free Radio kitchen for our bake-along recipe. This week, gluten-free crackers. Feel free for gluten-free, say, feel free to polish off their pasta, devour their desserts, relish their ready meals, savour their savoury bakes, munch on their muffins, grab their granolas... There's certainly lots of choice in the Feel Free for Gluten-Free range. Visit feelfreefoods.co.uk. Welcome along for the ride. This is another hour dedicated solely to you. Whether you are choosing to eat G-free or whether Mother Nature has made that choice for you, you're really welcome to the show. Over the next 60 minutes or so, we have two interviews then, one with Heinz, one with Nens, and also we go into the G-free radio kitchen as well. But first of all, let's uh, start off with that health news, as we usually do. And uh, this item entitled, When Should We Actually Test for Celiac Disease? Because, as you're probably aware, um, one... uh, Uh, disease or one problem, one autoimmune problem, begets another one. This from KevinMD.com, actually written by Sophie Balzora, who's a gastroenterologist. So uh, Sophie is writing, although this list isn't exhaustive, in fact, she's just mentioning four items, there are certainly groups of patients in which particular conditions or Clinical signs occur in significantly higher incidence, and those kinds of people are much more likely to have celiac disease. Now, you may already have been diagnosed with celiac disease, uh, or maybe you've chosen to go gluten-free because you just feel as though it helps you. Well, maybe this could be a deciding factor for you to go along to your health uh, professional and say to them, look, you know, I've got this and I've already decided myself that eating gluten-free helps me. You know, let's join the dots here. Maybe one reason is affecting the other. Maybe that underlying problem which you and I already know I have has also uh, meant that it's easier on my digestive system to eat without wheat. Okay, so let's run through these. These are the four, as they say, red flag uh, diagnosis. First of all, one IBSM and IBSD. Now we know what IBS is, irritable bowel syndrome, but first of all that M is the mixed type with the various different diagnoses and the IBSD is when you particularly have uh, diarrhea. Patients who carry a diagnosis of these IBS subsets should be screened because celiac disease is found much more commonly in such populations. Two. 
Certain autoimmune diseases. Well, one autoimmune disease begets another, Sophie says, and celiac disease is no different. So, comorbid diseases in particular that patients with celiac disease share include microscopic colitis, type 1 diabetes mellitus, which uh, we're we're pretty much aware of. Uh, Obviously, you can uh, uh, do a bit more research yourself and find out a bit more about that. Autoimmune liver diseases, inflammatory bowel diseases, they're pretty self-explanatory. But you may not have come across some of these other ones before. First of all, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now, we did mention this on the program a couple of episodes ago. This is when your immune system mistakenly attacks your thyroid gland, causing it to gradually swell and become damaged. The swollen thyroid gland may eventually cause a lump to form in your throat and the thyroid gland is slowly destroyed over time. It can't produce enough thyroid hormone and then you get low levels of, uh, of of thyroid in the blood. And essentially, very generally, that can lead to things like fatigue, weight gain, constipation, dry skin, depression. Some of these sound familiar, don't they? Because a lot of those, uh, let's, let's count them off. Um, certainly fatigue, um, certainly constipation, certainly dry skin, certainly depression are all uh, potentially signifiers of having of you having celiac disease as well. Really interesting stuff. Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So uh, if you've been diagnosed with that, it may be that you've got celiac disease as well. So possibly worth uh, getting that checked out. And also another one which is um, relatively unheard of, and that's Sjogren syndrome, which is. Well, let me spell that for you, if you're going to look it up as well. You pronounce it Sjogren syndrome, but it's actually spelt capital S-J-O. Dry mouth, dry eyes. Women are more commonly affected, uh, and and that can uh, obviously affect the moisture of of, of other parts of uh, of, of a woman's body. Let's, uh, Let's just put it that way, and cause a few problems there as well. So, um... If you think you might be affected by that and you haven't been previously diagnosed with celiac disease, maybe that could be an indicator that you should go along and and point that that link out or possible link uh, to your health professional. Okay, that's number one and two. Number three. Unexplained iron deficiency with or without anemia in premenopausal women. It's not uncommon for menstruating female patients to suffer from low iron stores, even anemia. Celiac serologies should be obtained to rule out iron malabsorption secondary to the duodenal villus atrophy that celiac disease creates. And four. Well, this is something that we've known about for a long time and is generally recognised in uh, patients with uh, celiac disease. And that's uh, people who've got a family history of celiac disease in a first-degree relative. So maybe your uh, near relative has celiac disease or maybe it's you with the disease and you might want to suggest that your first-degree relatives get tested as well. You know what? Um, looking at uh, my first degree relatives, uh, as you know, I have celiac disease, um, and there are a few signs that maybe they could have celiac disease as well. Uh, and I'm looking at my siblings, and I'm looking at my parents, and I've mentioned it to them. My parents are quite elderly, and I guess they don't particularly want to uh, make that particular uh, choice and change to their life. Uh, this particular age, uh, which is understandable. Um, And my brother and sister, well, you know, dump half of the Sahara into their back garden so they can bury their head in in, in that particular um, amount of sand. And I think I've summed up quite uh, accurately what they think about the situation. So uh, they're they're not interested. They don't particularly want to get tested. Uh, Well, you can lead a horse to water, can't you? But you can't make them drink. Celiac disease has been shown to run in families. So patients, particularly with those with digestive symptoms, should also undergo screening. So what are the best screening tests? Well, uh, Sophie, the gastroenterologist who's written this article, says uh, that the uh, trans 
Glutaminase IgA antibody is the best test, she says, given its high sensitivity and specificity. The caveat, though, is that close to 10% of celiacs are IgA deficient, so it would be prudent to check for an IgA level along with the TTGA. Uh, celiac disease affects close to 1% of the US population, and it's, it's, it's odd, isn't it? That's pretty much the same uh, rate around the world. Um, not an insignificant number, of course. Interestingly, population studies are finding that celiac does not discriminate. It affects all ages, races and ethnicities. And as we learn more about the disease, we find that its clinical presentation is becoming more varied, more nuanced and can even manifest without gastrointestinal symptoms. I know there's been a bit of debate about that over uh, recent months, but she says the sooner we diagnose patients with celiac disease and prescribe them to a strict gluten-free diet, the higher likelihood we have in potentially avoiding the morbidities that come along with the disease. So, if you want to uh, follow Sophie, Sophie Belzora, MD, if you want to read more about what she was saying and what I've just been saying, when should we test for celiac disease? It's at kevinmd.com. Let's uh, pass a couple of other items uh, via you. Um, actually, no, change a plan. Change a plan. I'm looking through the, to the producer at the moment, and they're saying, no, 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 Peter, they're saying, go straight to our first interview. So we'll do that. OK, uh, we'll bring you that item about um, hypothyroid patients, uh, those who have an underactive thyroid, kind of links in with what we were just saying, and also about uh, how charities, particularly Celiac UK, are welcoming uh, landmark new duties to support children with medical conditions in school. We'll bring you those items, the other side of this item, which comes up next. So we know Heinz had the slogan 57 varieties. We know the advertising phrase, beans means Heinz. We also know the cheeky schoolboy version of that. We know they make ketchup and soups, more recently in the UK anyway, pies and pasties. Did you know about their gluten-free range? Well, we've been talking to Heinz about why they moved into the market and where they go next. Right, well, this is a new and welcome development from Heinz. You know what? I could always trust your ketchup, and I've gone back to your ketchup since my local supermarket decided to change their recipe to put gluten in it. So uh, that's always reassuring that I can always have your ketchup. But now you've developed another range as well. Tell us about your new gluten-free range, Alison from Heinz. So we have developed a range of six gluten-free products, three delicious gluten-free pastas, a penne, spaghetti and macaroni. I think we're one of the few macaronis on shelf actually, so mac and cheese um, is back firm favourite on the list of, uh, of products you can eat. And um, three delicious sauces, so uh, a frito, which means it's um, got infusion of onion and garlic in tomato sauce that has been the onion and garlic has been gently fried first so that's what our frito is the basil and an oregano tomato pasta sauce so um, really quick little meals that can be made for a reasonable price actually as you'd expect from Heinz. Now pasta is notoriously difficult isn't it to make and, 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 and to cook as a, as a consumer have you managed to get that consistency right and also the starch level right as well? Well, we have two secret ingredients. Uh, we have one secret ingredient, which is 100 years of perfecting this in Italy. So we have a fantastic Italian team in Heinz, Italy, that have been developing this pasta literally for 100 years. Um, and the second secret ingredient, we think, is the, the mixture between corn flour, potato flour, and lupin flour, which is slightly unique in this market and really helps the pasta keep its taste and bite. OK, and I've not heard of lupin flour. I've come across teff flour just about half an hour ago, which is quite new to me. But what, what is lupin flour? Um, lupin is a, is a flour that you can find in the okay. garden, but it comes from the pea family. So lupin is from the pea family, and the flour from that um, is used in our product. Now, some people might have to be a little bit careful. A very, very few um, percent of people have uh, peanut allergies, and so we are part of the peanut family with lupin flour. But for most people, it's absolutely fine, and it's that combination of corn flour, potato flour, and lupin flour is really... 
um, really helping to keep the texture perfect. OK, now Heinz is, uh, is an American brand, isn't it? Did you launch this in America first, or are we first here in the UK with the, with the gluten-free range? This is the first ever Heinz-branded, dedicated gluten-free range to be launched Oh, we beat the, the Americans. We that's, that's, that's good. We, we always did. like that. Yes. We always like that. So, and then you're going to go, what, but if it works here, and I'm sure it is, take that to the US? We are talking to our US colleagues, our Canadian colleagues, our Australian colleagues, and also in conversation with the rest of Europe, our German colleagues. So, yes, it's proving to work here very well. We're already in Tesco's at much higher distribution than we thought in Morrison's, about to be in Asda. And so I think we are proving the success here, and it should travel the world. And Heinz, uh, really shaking up the, the kind of gluten-free market, aren't you? You and Warburton's, what I mean is established brands that then have another kind of sub-brand, if you like, with the gluten-free market, whereas traditionally, I'm thinking of perhaps Genius Breads, for example, they've started off small, they've grown specifically in that market. Yes, a big brand name coming in is something that's uh, fairly new, I suppose. It's not so much about the big brand name for us. It's just bringing our delicious food to as many people as we can. So it's nice for everybody to feel that they can eat a brand like Heinz and enjoy it and that they can be safe with it. We have a lot of trust behind our brand name and, and being in the gluten-free category just seemed to make sense from that point of view. But it's a, it's a huge market, isn't it? I'm just looking down some, some figures here. Uh, gluten-free food category worth $140 million in the UK, growing at 23% a year. Yes. I mean... I guess the food industry has not seen a growth like that probably ever before, has it? Probably not. Maybe only in certain niche areas. I imagine when smoothies came on board, they probably did that to the drinks sector or something like that. But uh, but yes, it is, it is big and growing. And I think that's because Celiac UK are doing some fantastic work to promote more recognition of symptoms and more diagnosis at doctors and um, surgeries and places like that. And there's a, a raft of people who are hearing that living gluten-free can bring them health benefits. I think the entire US Olympic team was put on a gluten-free diet to maximise the energy that they could expend on their sport instead. So there's a few things like that that are bringing gluten-free living to the general public. Now obviously Heinz develops other foods in other areas, not just pasta and pasta sauces, but other things like, as, as well. I'm thinking of, of, of soups notably. Where do you go with the gluten-free range? Are you going to be doing a range of soups or well, how does that develop? Watch this space. Uh, myself and my colleagues are currently have about 12 more products in the pipeline. They'll all be savoury. Um, they'll be the sorts of things that you would expect to find from Heinz. So you're not going into the into the bread and cake area because that wouldn't really fit with your with your core kind of product, it's, would it? It's not our it's not our core capability, yeah. is it? Baking. We're not a baker. <laughs> we're not one of the sort of people that you would say, "Well, Heinz, they're a baker." We're very we're very good at delicious, savoury food at a reasonable price that you know you can trust. And so that's kind of where our footprint will will be for the time being. When we've spoken to celiacs and gluten intolerance, on the go is one of the big issues for them. So how many products do you reckon in the next year? Ooh, could get up to 15 or 20 maybe, I don't wow. know. So that's going to be a huge already. expansion. Six okay. already, so it could, I guess it could double or so, and then maybe a little bit more. Let's say 15. This is G Free Radio. OK, and don't forget, we're in the G-Free Radio kitchen a little bit later on. And uh, this week, crackers. You can make your own crackers. They can be pretty expensive, can't they, if you buy them in the shops. We've got such a really cool, fantastic, tasty, but easy recipe for you. Deborah's going to be along. Deborah Thackeray is going to be along, uh, one of the friends of the show. So uh, we'll be hearing from her a little bit later. So you'll be able to cook along. And also, the recipe as well is available for you as well just go to our main Spreaker site so it's probably where you're listening to this and uh, go there and the recipe is there make it really really easy for you so that's coming up a little bit later on a couple of other items for you this side of that hypothyroid patients um, in other words those who have an underactive thyroid should routinely be tested for celiac disease this is according to Dr Richard S. Barrick. Uh, he was talking in Digestive Disease Week, uh, which was uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, really, re- really interesting stuff, which fits in with the first item that we were talking about from, um, from Sophie, the gastroenterologist. Um, this article comes from familypracticenews.com and says that mass screening for celiac disease in the broad population isn't recommended at the moment because of the prevalence, uh, 0.75%, is deemed too low to justify such a 
practice. However, current national and international guidelines do recommend routine testing for case finding in selected populations known to be at increased risk of celiac disease. This is very much following on from what we were talking about a little bit earlier on. These include, for example, patients with asymptomatic iron deficiency anemia who have celiac disease prevalence of 2.3% to 5%. Thus, the 5% prevalence of celiac disease in hypothyroid patients requiring high-dose levothyroxine in order to maintain a euthroid state is at least as high as and perhaps higher than the prevalence in groups having a guideline recommended indication for testing according to the director of GI endoscopy at the University of of Vermont in Burlington uh, the uh, previously mentioned Dr Richard S. Barrick so uh, there's uh, a bit more weight to what we were saying uh, to start off the programme so again another possible reason for you to get tested uh, checked out for celiac disease if you've chosen at this stage uh, to go gluten free and uh, another item just ahead of our uh, talk um, with uh, with the, the Nens oat cake people in a few moments time is this and this is really interesting stuff you know we say really interesting about so many items on the G Free radio show and I hope you agree we're getting more and more listeners all all of the time, and that's hardly surprising, perhaps, considering that we are the world's only G-free radio show. It's the only podcast in the entire world which is dedicated to people who've been diagnosed with celiac disease or have chosen to live a gluten-free lifestyle. Um, and this is what is happening at schools in England. Now, I say England specifically uh, because it is only England, uh, not the United Kingdom, not Great Britain, which, of course, are, are different terms referring to uh, to different parts of the uh, United Nations, uh, as it would be, of the British Isles. So this is just in England because education is devolved to Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland separately. And a group of national health charities are welcoming new statutory guidance to improve support in schools to over one million children with long-term medical conditions and as well as people with celiac disease kids with celiac disease it's also kids with anaphylaxis a stroke type 1 diabetes heart disease cancer asthma so um, I think you'll probably agree that uh, amongst those um, celiac disease is uh, maybe a little bit uh, down the uh, the pecking order and you'd probably understand that to be the case and probably agree with that but uh, we're in amongst the, these kiddies who, who, who are battling some much more severe problems as I think you might agree heart disease cancer personally I would suggest are, are rather higher than us but anyway on to these rules sent to schools, the new statutory guidance was issued by the government following its landmark decision last year to amend the Children and Families Act. Now, from September this year, schools in England will be legally required to provide the high-quality support children with medical conditions need. The guidance for the new law is statutory. It sets out the practical support schools will be expected to provide to support those children, such as making sure they've got individual health care plans in place and also um, training and support for school staff. Um, the charities who represent the kids with those uh, medical issues form the Health Conditions in Schools Alliance. They represent over a million children in England alone who have these particular health needs. They called for this legal protection because under the current system, uh, up until September 2014, while many schools already offer excellent support for kids with health conditions, there are too many examples where children with health needs are prevented from meeting their full educational potential as a result of ill health. You can understand that. You know, time off perhaps to uh, to go and see a health professional, maybe uh, time off because they are unwell, possibly in our case because they have eaten the wrong thing. But also, and this is really interesting, they are failing to meet their full educational potential because of bullying and stigma at school. And Looking at at celiac disease specifically, we know already, don't we, we've covered it many times on the programme, how people can be sidelined, how they can be picked on, how they can be bullied 
at school because they're not eating the same thing as the other kids. They've got to bring in a special lunch. Maybe they've got to go somewhere different to get their their plated up school meal. Maybe because of cross contamination issues, they sit in a different area. Maybe they can't join in with um, with a picnic on the school field at the end of term in the summer. Maybe uh, when it's a cake day or a kid's birthday and cakes are brought in, they can't partake. Maybe that leads on to something else, such as not having as many friends or not. We've heard this story before, haven't we, guys? Uh, not being invited to someone else's birthday party at their home or the school hall or the local church hall or at the uh, the play den or the ballpark or wherever it happens to be because those mums don't know what to provide for the little kid who eats funny in vertical commas i'm doing rabbit ears yeah so it's really good that this kind of stuff is um happening in schools to kind of reduce that stigma some children face discrimination in relation to school trips and extracurricular activities which means they're effectively excluded from leading a full and active school life in addition some schools fail to support the social and emotional implications associated with medical conditions this is such a big topic isn't it we really must get um get someone on over the next uh, few weeks or months probably months um a little bit later on in the year we will definitely do that about bringing up a celiac child and also about what you can do to help integrate uh, children um and, and what, what you can do to, to to help increase their emotional experience despite them being diagnosed with celiac disease so so all those charities are calling on schools to implement the government's new guidance and work with parents, local authorities and health services to ensure children with medical conditions can get the highest quality support they need. So who have they been speaking to? Who is supporting this new guidance? Well, Asthma UK, uh, also the British Heart Foundation, uh, Click Sergeant, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the charity uh, for uh, for kids with uh, with cancer, the Cystic Fibrosis Trust, the Stroke Association, the Anaphylaxis Campaign, Young Epilepsy, the Children's Heart Foundation, uh, Eric, the Education and Resources for Improving Child Continent. Oh boy, oh boy, I've not heard of that before. Oh gosh, it makes you weep, doesn't it, to think what some kiddies go through. I mean that really so heartfelt that. And the embarrassment and the trauma and, and, and the exclusion that they must go through with... Oh. Um, uh, Chief Executive of Little Hearts Matter. Also, the Migraine Trust, the Association of Young People with ME. And um, I've put it at the bottom of the list um, purely because then I can talk a bit more about them. Celiac UK. Now, Sarah Sleep, the chief exec of uh, Celiac UK, who was a guest on the programme, of course, uh, back at the start of the year, says, quote, the recognition in law that children with long term conditions need recognition and support at school to fulfil their full potential will be welcomed by parents everywhere. Now, the trick is to translate words into action. And as a charity with long experience of working with children who have celiac disease, we are ready to offer a helping hand to schools in addressing their needs. You know what? I think, well, I'm again looking through the, the, through the class at the producer. Yeah, I think what we'll do is, they're reading my mind, what we'll do is we'll make a note to speak to someone, maybe Celiac UK, maybe another group, uh, maybe someone from the Health Conditions in Schools Alliance about what that actually means for children uh, as they start school and as they go through their school career. Really, really important stuff. OK. Uh, other side of uh, the little uh, guitar strumming, we'll hear from Nairn's Oats. gfreeradio.com and also gfreeradio on Twitter, gfreeradio at hotmail.com if you want to get in touch with us and uh, tell us what you like about the show or pass on any information that you want us to uh, publicise on the airwaves. This is the world's only programme which is 
worldwide. It is weekly and it is purely for people who have been diagnosed with celiac disease or maybe you if you've chosen to live a G-free lifestyle for whatever reason. You're welcome to come along and learn a little bit more about uh, the diagnosis and also the products and also some background and also some of the health implications, the social implications about living G-free. I'm Peter Stewart. So earlier on we heard about Heinz. Now we're going to hear a bit more about oats. And uh, names is one of the biggest names in oats in the UK, from porridge pots to sweet and savoury biscuits, all based around the humble oat. But hold on, can't oats be cross-contaminated? Yeah, Benenza has a way round that. In our chat with them in this week's episode, hear how they ensure their oats are just that, oats. Pure and free from gluten, guaranteed. And also why oats are such an important part of anyone's diet and certainly an important part of a diet for someone who's got celiac disease. You know what, years ago someone offered you an oat cake and it would be dry and crumbly and it would taste like a bit of cardboard. Well, things have changed, haven't they? You're laughing. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Lucy, who's head of marketing at Nens. Now, now you really are the, the oats people, aren't you? We uh, are. And, yeah. and you kind of moved away from those really thick, boring, tasteless, bland, cardboardy, dry oat cakes of years ago. Uh, because uh, well, you, you put a bit of flavour into them. We have. Well, we recognise that oats are a bit of a superfood. They've got a lot going for them. Whole, whole grain, high in fibre, particularly high in soluble fibre, which is the type of fibre that fills you up and keeps you going, you know, the slow energy release. Um, and oat cakes is another way of getting oats, other than porridge, because life would be a bit boring if we all just ate porridge all day long. Um, so oat cakes are a great way to um, consume oats, and we've tried to make them a bit more enjoyable to eat, so they're lighter and crunchy and crispy, but they're still substantial. They'll fill you up, they'll keep you going. Um, and you can eat them in so many different ways, very versatile, top them with something sweet or savoury, breakfast, lunch or a snack. Absolutely. Now, some of these oat cakes, in fact, I'm just going to move around because I'm just going to remind myself what your different flavours are of, of, of oat cakes. So the ordinary oat cakes, I love the cheese ones and also the herby ones as well. And the herby ones I discovered, I think, for the first time here, was that last year? Or was it the year yes, before? they're relatively new, cheese and herbs. So yeah. this is our gluten-free range yeah. that we've got the show today. We have a main range of the yeah. supermarkets that you'll find in the main parts of the... Um, the fixer by um, general crackers and yeah, rice cakes the, and things. Yeah. But the gluten free range we have in the free from section We've got plain oat cakes, cheese, and then herb and seeds. And uh, the cheese are actually a personal favourite of mine. I actually think the gluten free cheese tastes even better than the, <laughs> the main cheese. And, and you have some ber- ones with berries in as well, We've don't got, you? Yeah, Is that so right? not, not in our gluten free range, but in our wheat. So everything which is wheat free, and on our main range, we've got biscuits. So a lot of people think they're oat cakes and tell us that they like our chocolate oat cakes, but they're actually just a healthier biscuit. So they're, but they're made with whole grain oats, so the same fibre, lower sugar, lower calorie than average biscuit. Chocolate, mixed berry, fruit and spice, and they're in a sort of taller, um, sort of portrait sized carton. You get four pouch packs inside the carton, so they're designed to be eaten on the go. Now, I really like that because very often, and a lot of companies used to do this but moved away from them, the, the smaller packets inside the larger packets, and I guess that's because of cost, but. Cost it, and if, packaging concerns yeah. sometimes, yeah, but. So some of our range um, will have a few more biscuits in each pouch pack, but the way we make our products and our oat cakes are the same is that we think you should be able to keep your product fresh without it going stale and having to throw the packet away, but also recognise that people are leading busy lives, you're all on the go. It's quite handy when you can pop a packet of oat cakes or a packet of biscuits into your bag, um, and then you've got a good oaty whole grain snack that you can enjoy when you're on the go. So we think it's quite important. Lots of our customers tell us that they like that fact about it. And you are, I think, one of the uh, original people who had the uh, had the porridge, the, the, the little bowls of porridge that you can take to work and just top up with water or milk or whatever and have porridge on the go. Yes, well, we've had our gluten-free porridge and an instant porridge in the market for a couple of years now, but we were the first to launch a gluten-free porridge pot. So you'll see sort of quite a few big brands like Oh So Simple um, making a, you know, porridge a bit more convenient so that you can enjoy it at work when you haven't got a hob. And, uh, but nobody was doing a gluten-free version, so we recognised the opportunity. So if you're at work, all you need is access to a kettle. You take one of our pots with you, you pour in some boiling water and you've got porridge. Also quite handy, quite a lot of consumers have been telling us today, for when you go on holiday. 
because you often find that it's very difficult to get a gluten-free breakfast in your hotel. Pack one of our pots into your bag, take it down to a Just restaurant one? in the morning. Just one? Yeah, well, okay. dozens. Fill How up many? the suitcase. Yeah. <laughs> Might as well. You don't need swimming trunks. <laughs> if you, yeah, if you, exactly, if you choose to fill up your suitcase or take an extra one, or get your partner just to pack, you know, take your clothes in their suitcase, then, uh, yeah, it's quite a good way to But do that. check with customs regulations, just in case you yeah. try and take these in. We can't be held responsible <laughs> well, if they're confiscated. Dried, dried goods, so I don't think it should be okay, any. shouldn't it? And it's all sealed. sealed. It's sealed. Absolutely, okay. that's... Yeah, I'm sure it's all right. That's the main thing. And, of course, usually I've been asking people, where can you get hold of, of your particular product, Mr. Person on the Stall? Yeah. And uh, they've said, uh, oh, this website or that website. Actually, your, your stuff is readily available, isn't it, in the it supermarkets? Is. All our free from, all our gluten-free range is in the free from section of Tesco, Sainsbury's, Waitrose, Morrison's, Asta. Uh, most products are in all stores. Waitrose is great because they take everything we do, um, as do um, most, uh, Tesco take most of our, our range. Sainsbury's and Asda have also got um, a pretty good range. And then our non-gluten-free stuff, so our, which is sort of still wheat-free, is available everywhere in all the major supermarkets. So hopefully it should be easy to find. Now, it's really great when uh, companies are not just pushing the food to make a profit, but they're also actually concerned about people's health. Yeah. And obviously you, you are perhaps the, the most established uh, oat business around, certainly that's doing the, the gluten-free range. And, and you're particularly keen, obviously, for people to eat your products, but it seems as though you actually care about them eating the oats. Oats are a very important part of your diet, aren't they? Definitely. And whether you eat Nairn's oats or any other brand's oats, we are very keen for celiacs in particular to understand the facts about using uh, gluten-free oats and including them safely in their diet. And We've done some research that's shown that uh, over a quarter of celiacs don't eat any oats or oat-based foods, so oat cakes, oat biscuits, etc. at all. And is that part, part of the reason because people are a bit worried about cross-contamination? Or yes. I guess a lot of people There's, still think gluten is in oats. There is quite a bit of confusion, yeah. yeah. And so, so basically, oats are naturally gluten-free. You would not find gluten in oats. Cross-contamination is the issue. So the fact that oats are often grown in fields near wheat or barley or rye, or they're often milled in the same mill, or the products could be baked in the same factory as other products containing wheat. So, so the seeds from one field could blow to another, could, and that they could get mixed up in machinery. Exactly, in the, yeah. in the atmosphere, um, to a very low level. So if, if you're gluten intolerant, we see that many um, people on the gluten-free diet, whether it's for lifestyle or sort of mild intolerance reasons, could just have normal gluten-free oats but if you're a celiac you should be concerned about potential contamination so you, you should go for safe pure gluten-free oats that have been farmed separately milled separately and then any products are made in a separate gluten-free factory and that's how our gluten-free oats are so we make sure we get them from certain farms they're milled separately we've set up a dedicated gluten-free bakery where we bake all our gluten-free oats products so that way you can be sure there's absolutely no gluten in those oats they are safe to consume and there's a lot of misunderstanding particularly amongst celiacs who were diagnosed a number of years ago because at the time they were diagnosed there were no safe gluten-free oats available so they were advised to avoid oats but the situation has changed it's really important that those celiacs understand that because there are now gluten-free oats readily available to consume however when you are newly diagnosed, your dietitian will advise you to avoid oats for the first six Absolutely, months to yeah. a year. And that is because a certain percentage, the Celiac UK estimate this to be about 5% of celiacs, are also allergic to a protein in oats called avalin. So it's not the same as gluten, but like gluten is a protein in wheat, avalin is a protein in oats. And so you could also be allergic to avalin. And therefore, avoid oats for the first 6 to 12 months, then start to reintroduce them into your diet. If you see no side effects, yeah. then you're absolutely fine to consume them. And for 95% of the population, that's, how, that's the case. But we obviously advise that you do that in consultation with your doctor or your dietitian. But if something goes wrong, go back to the dog. Go back to the dog, exactly. Exactly. That's why you should get help, you know, get them with you as you're monitoring this and including this in your diet so you can be sure uh, to understand what the problems are or any side effects are. Um, but the reason that we really want people to know that, because not a lot of people know all those, those facts, is that if you can tolerate oats, they have a lot of nutritional value in your diet. So I'm having porridge every morning, which is obviously good for a celiac. Because, yeah. Well, first of all, it means that you're having a bit more milk, doesn't it? Which is which is obviously good. It's got, you, you've got more calcium and yes. so on. But, but also, I, I get up at half past three in the morning, so I'm reckoning that porridge is good because that's going to keep me going for longer. It is, and that's about the fibre. So that's because it's got it's high in soluble fibre. Oats has got one of the highest soluble fibre contents of all grains 
and soluble fiber is one that fills you up and it also helps balance your blood sugar levels and therefore keeps so this is the whole cholesterol GI. thing is it no separate to cholesterol it's okay. all about energy all so right. low glycemic index is about not having big sharp spikes and sugar rushes and then sugar lows yeah. if you can get a steady release of the sugar the slow release energy through the day you will keep going for longer you're less encouraged to snack between meals and therefore you know that helps with weight control as well as feeling good and feeling like you've got enough energy um, but it's also got another type of fiber in it called insoluble fiber and that's the fiber that helps with digestion and we so this is going to keep you regular, keep everything working exactly, properly. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And a lot of celiacs suffer from getting enough fiber in their diets because if you're eating a gluten-free bread, pastry, cakes, muffins, uh, biscuits that have been made with ingredients like potato flour, tapioca, rice, sort of starch and um, rice flour, those are grains or potatoes that don't, don't have as much fiber to start with and secondly they have been quite highly processed and um, so a lot of the nutrients have been stripped out of them um, and therefore you can be, if you're not eating your normal whole grain bread for example how else are you going to get whole grain and fiber in your diet um, and so oats are a really important way for celiacs to consume some or a useful way for them to consume fiber and we work with a leading nutritionist called christine bailey who regularly tells us that cel- most celiacs lack enough fiber in their diet so your your, your message is get your oats Definitely, definitely. There is uh, so many benefits to be had um, from a health perspective in the fact that whole grain, the high in fibre, they still you up, they'll keep you going and they'll keep you regular. Um, but at the same time, they taste really good because we haven't had to make a, an oat cake with an odd, strange combination of ingredients. But it's the same recipe. Our gluten free oat cakes are made with the same recipe that our normal oat cakes are. So there's no difference in taste. Texture. It's funny, isn't it, the resurgence in the popularity of porridge, because, what, five, ten years ago, people would just see porridge as boring, bland, yeah. stodgy, wallpaper paste, and suddenly everyone's right. rediscovered it, That's which is brilliant. True. Yes, and I think a lot of that is because people are leading such busy, hectic lives. Um, we all want to crave a bit more energy in our day because we're all trying to get a bit more out of our day. It's filling, and it can be tasty because you can put different toppings on. It can be sugar, it can be honey, it can be fruit. Yeah, exactly. But customise it and make it your own. It's almost like making a perfect cup of tea. You know, everyone's perfect cup is completely different. Porridge is exactly the same. You know, Goldilocks and the three bears. <laughs> There, some people like it runny, some like it thick, some like it sweet. In Scotland, the traditional way to make porridge is oats, water and salt. Um, whereas, you know, try, try showing that to many southerners and I think they turn their nose up. Yeah, I think it's got to be more yeah, milk found and milk, sugar and brown sugar, I think. Than, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which probably summarises the difference between English and the Scots quite well, I think. Feel free for gluten-free, say feel free to... Polish off their pasta, devour their desserts, relish their ready meals, savour their savoury bakes, munch on their muffins, grab their granolas. Whew, there's certainly lots of choice in the Feel Free for Gluten Free range. Visit feelfreefoods.co.uk. Gosh, it certainly is a bumper edition, isn't it? A bumper episode of the G Free Radio Show this week. Hope you're uh, managing to, uh, to to listen along. And don't forget, all of our shows are archived. You can always go back and listen to shows. Or if you miss some of this week's show, you can always go back and listen. It'll always be there. And it'll always be free as well. So uh, very glad for the loan of your ears in this week's programme. Don't forget to tell your friends. If you go to a support group, or if you have a message board, or a blog... Uh, Maybe you get together with other people. Maybe you bump into people. Maybe as you're as you're standing in the store perusing the G Free aisle and the shelves there, please mention about that podcast on that there iTunes. We're available on iTunes and YouTube, as you know. Or follow us, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, on Twitter at G Free Radio. It's a really easy name for you to remember, isn't it? And pass along G free radio that's what it's all about so we've got our tweets of the week still to come and also we'll be heading uh, in a few minutes time into the g free radio kitchen and we'll be hearing from deborah thackeray and she's got a fantastic recipe you can bake along uh, with uh, gluten-free crackers this week so we'll be trying those out with a with a nice slice of Wensleydale or something of that nature a little bit later on. Uh, a couple of things to bring you just ahead of that. We'll be telling you about 
Uh, what have we got? Some uh, G-free noodles, which have been launched in the UK, which a company has told us about. So if you want your product mentioned, then don't forget to write to us, G-free radio at hotmail.com. Um, just uh, doing a little bit of housekeeping uh, in this part of the programme. And Gareth has written to me. This is about what we call ourselves, which you'll remember was an item that we ran a couple of weeks ago where someone said, oh, I'm not a celiac, I'm someone who's got celiac disease. After all, you don't say um, someone is, uh, is a spastic anymore. You say they have uh, a cerebral palsy or something like that. Uh, however, someone has pointed out you do say someone is a diabetic. You know, what do we call ourselves so people aren't offended? Well, Gareth has written, what's wrong with celiacs? In my humble opinion, the sort of people who object to the phrase are just concerned with the bowdlerisation of our language. The sorts of people that covered up table legs because they thought them indecent. It was still a table underneath. How about calling people with celiac just people? I mean, that can't offend anyone. Does that help? How can it? Your GP has look at your diagnosis and tells you your biopsies have come back and you are diagnosed as a person. Hmm... That's not helpful. I think, therefore, we should call celiacs not non-celiacs. Although I'm sure someone could be offended by that as well. Oh, well, kind regards, says Gareth. And then he got back to me a, uh, a, a day or so later saying, um, thanks very much. Oh, I love the podcast, by the way. Very informative, very up to date. So Gareth, really appreciate that. And he says, by the way, I'm expecting a big pushback from the wheat lobby. I think it was in one of your podcasts that you mentioned that wheat sales were falling due to the gluten-free uptake through lifestyle choice as well as celiacs. And Gareth says, I used to work in PR. Basically, big wheat, the big wheat companies, will employ a lobby company to write stories and place them all over on blogs and any journal, any website that's too idle to write for themselves. He says, I've seen a rise in anti uh, GF stories in the last few weeks uh, and, and that's a news article for you in itself uh, and, and absolutely uh, Gareth is based in the UK I can tell from some other information that he's given me uh, that is certainly very very true certainly we're monitoring all sorts of websites and blogs and news sites I use the term loosely um, around the world and certainly if you're listening to this in the US of A you'll recognise that there's uh, been quite a push um, against people who live a gluten-free lifestyle not specifically the celiacs but certainly the um shall we say the trendy g freers the people who choose to go gluten-free now it's a broad church and if you're listening to this and you've chosen to go gl gluten-free hey you're an adult that's absolutely fantastic and hopefully this podcast this radio show can help you along your way with some health advice some food advice uh, and, and, and give you a bit more of an insight into, in, into what it is like to be a celiac. We welcome you along. It's fantastic that you've taken the time and trouble to listen in. Um, but, and you will probably notice yourself that there's been quite a big kick against you guys, which is really, really sad. Essentially, um, it's the B word, isn't it, that we mentioned a little bit earlier on in the show, and that is bullying. If someone doesn't want to eat wheat, rye, barley, heck, what does it really matter to anyone else? And you know what? Something that we've, we've noticed, um, a lot of tweets over the past uh, few months, and that is the Yaboo sucks attitude, the bullying from some people, particularly on Twitter, and it can, I'm sure, be replicated face-to-face -face as well. Huh, why have you cut out gluten? You don't even know what gluten is. And you know what my comeback to that is? Well, hold on a minute. You're eating gluten. Do you know what it is that you're actually eating? I mean, it's a bit bizarre to be poked fun at because you, inverted commas, may not know what it is that you've cut out. But you may not know what you're actually eating. And surely that's much more dangerous. Anyway... I'll climb off the soapbox, bring you those couple of other items before we uh, head off into the kitchen with Deborah. Uh, I can see that um, she's got her pinny on. She's, uh, she's cleaned her hands, 
a bit of poetic license, you understand. And uh, she's got her chef's hat on. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the, the G-Free crackers from the G-Free radio kitchen on the way. 37% of consumers would visit food service outlets more often if they offered gluten-free options, according to a consumer insight. Uh, 36% of people would be willing to pay more for celiac-friendly dishes, according to a uh, Cafe Consumer Trend Report of February 2014. The ever-growing gluten-free market is believed to be worth £516 million by 2016. 78% of people believe operators aren't doing enough to cater for gluten intolerances, according to those reports. And Andrew Ely, friend of the show. Hi, Andrew. He's the MD of Armandy. They make the um, the Swedish, um, well, essentially Swedish cheesecakes, which are available. Um, not in the gluten-free aisle, they're in the general aisle, uh, because they're Swedish, they're, they're made with almond flour, incidentally. And um, Andrew says, gluten-free is a market caterers can no longer afford to ignore. 11% of the UK population avoid gluten for medical or lifestyle reasons, harking back to what we just said. And our own independent research shows a further 71% of the population is guided by the needs of someone with a gluten intolerance when dining out. This means operating could be missing out on not only the gluten-free pound, but whole parties. Now is the time to take action. I've said it before, um, and uh, I'll, I'll say it again, possibly in about five seconds' time. And that is that if you have a group of people at your office, at your church, uh, maybe a social gathering, whatever it happens to be, and they all say, heck, it's the end of a week, let's go out for something to eat. Heck, it's Bob's birthday, let's go out for a meal. Um, the day of the week has got a Y in it, it's time we hit the restaurant. Uh, or, or, or maybe it's summer, or we're all off on our holidays, or someone's just had a baby, or whatever it happens to be, and you go out for a meal, hopefully, and this happens an awful lot in my experience, and hopefully it happens with you as well, hold on, where can most of us eat? Um, you know, Sally is celiac. Sally, where's the best places for you to go? Yeah, that place? Okay, well, we can all eat there, can't we? Absolutely, we'll, we'll head off there. And you know what? There are certain um, restaurants that I can name and I've named in the past on the show where their provision for gluten-free food is so poor, you know what? When I've got a party of 10, 15, 20 people, we just don't go there. We don't go there. Now, bearing in mind that if you're going for a, uh, a slap-up meal, and I appreciate it could just be the end of a week, you know, kind of bar snacks or something like that. If you're going for an end of the week, um, sorry, if you're going for a celebratory meal and it is something pretty big, maybe you're having a splurge, perhaps, and you're going to be really treating yourself, how much are you going to be spending? Well, OK, let's, uh, let's, 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 Let's top this up. So you can have a starter, all right? A starter, let's say a starter is five pounds, okay? And then you're going to be having a main course, and I think it's probably going to be 15 pounds. Then you're going to be having a dessert, and I think we're going to say that's another fiver. And I think you're probably going to think, uh, me, I'm reasonably conservative here. We're not, we're not actually, you know, going to a top-class, super-duper restaurant here, but this is a, you know, kind of family restaurant kind of fair. And you're also going to be having maybe a couple of glasses of wine, or uh, some beers, and in a restaurant, that's probably another fiver each, isn't it? So what should we say? Three drinks, that's another £15. Uh, pounds. Already we're up to £40 a head, OK? Uh, let's say £40, and let's say 10 people are going. £400 that some of these restaurants are missing out on because you decided to go to one restaurant, restaurant A, which does gluten-free food, as opposed to restaurant B that doesn't. They're idiots, aren't they? Moving on. <laughs> I'm having a go this week, aren't I? I'm not pulling my punches this week. No, no, no. Um, incidentally, if there's a punch that you don't want to be pulled, invite yourself on the show. Yeah, if there's something which uh, is a bee in your bonnet about something, come on the show. Absolutely. Well, get in touch with us. Uh, gfreeradio.hotmail.com. We can have a chinwag about it. Yeah, you can sound off. 
Um, that's not a problem at all. Get in touch with us. We'd uh, love to have your input. Um, this uh, from Kabuto. Kabuto Noodles launches gluten-free rice noodle pots. Now, this is really interesting. Uh, rice noodles usually... Uh, gluten-free, of course, and um, uh, Sharwoods, I think, is the big name, isn't it, in the gluten-free rice noodles in the UK. They do all the the, the, uh, the noodle brands in the United Kingdom. The rice noodles, which are really well labelled on the front, gluten-free, not available in my Sainsbury's, are available in my Tesco's, other supermarkets are available. Um, premium instant noodle makers Kabuto, gluten-free rice noodles, as I say, in a pot. OK, so let's read you what they've said in their press release to me. With 80% of people unaware that they're gluten intolerant, interesting, the broadening free-from-range of gluten-free products is excitingly expanding into convenience foods that are usually out of bounds for those intolerant. OK, the noodles are also perfect for chosen gluten-free diets and lifestyles, proving a popular choice amongst celebrities. OK, and a great option for light, hassle-free lunches on a busy day. These pots are one ninety nine to £2.50 per pot in Ocado and Whole Foods. Um, doesn't say how much you get for £2.50. Um, OK, so... Um, so, so, so that's interesting. Let's see, see what else they've got here. They've sent me several pages. I won't read it all out. Um, and it says here, uh, it isn't easy to find a quick, convenient and filling lunch that tastes great but is also gluten-free. I thought it actually is, but there you go. It's becoming more so, certainly. Um, the combination of being celiac and... Um, oh, no, that's something completely different. Beg your pardon. We'll do that next week. Who put this? Who's, who's producing this show? No, 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 no. No, no, no. Gluten-free and vegetarians. That's coming up in a, in a show in a couple of weeks. You put the wrong script in there. So uh, anyway, uh, I've given them enough plugs. So that particular noodle, uh, noodle pot range is, uh, is interesting there. So we'll uh, uh, look out for that with interest. OK, let's head into the, uh, into the kitchen. Deborah, you ready? Hi, I'm Deborah Thackeray from Gluten-Free Baking and Living. And what I do is I teach people how to bake their own lovely stuff gluten-free at home. You can find recipes, ideas, links to my courses on glutenfreebaking.co.uk. What we're going to be making today is something that you don't often find a recipe for. We're going to make a cracker. Gluten-free crackers can be bought, but they're awfully expensive for what they are. So I'm going to show you today a way of making your own cracker that you can have with cheese or as a snack with a drink. And the recipe that I've chosen to make today is flavoured with caraway seeds, although you can put other seeds in or other flavourings. What you're going to need is some Dove's Farm gluten-free plain flour. You'll need 60 grams of that. And you'll also need 20 grams of gram flour and 40 grams of ground almonds. You'll need half a teaspoon of salt, half a teaspoon of ground black pepper, two teaspoons of caraway seeds, a medium egg and a teaspoonful of cold water. You'll also need to have preheated your oven to 180 degrees centigrade, 350 Fahrenheit, that's gas mark 4, and you'll need a baking sheet which has been lined either with baking parchment or with one of those silicon baking tray liners. This recipe is going to make about 24 crackers. Pulse the two flours and the ground almonds, the salt and the pepper and the caraway seed in a food processor. So that's the dove's plain. I'm now going to add 20 grams of gram flour to that and 40 grams of ground almonds. If you haven't got a food processor, one of the things that you can do to get this really thoroughly mixed together is to put it through a sieve a couple of times. I'm going to add half a teaspoon of salt and half a teaspoonful of ground black pepper. Now it's time for the caraway seed. Caraway seeds are lovely. They've got a slightly aniseedy flavour, which I think is delicious in these crackers. So a couple of teaspoons of caraway seeds. 
I'm giving that a really good stir to mix together. But as I said, the best way of combining this really is to whiz it all together in a food processor. Here I'm pulsing it all together. Right. Into that, I'm now going to break my egg and stir that in. And what you're aiming for here is a sort of thick paste, like a pastry, because you're going to roll it out very thin. So now that's almost there, and it just needs a teaspoonful of cold water. And it starts to come together now as a dough. It's leaving the bowl completely clean, and I'm squidging it now into a ball in my hands. Get a piece of baking parchment and flour it with a bit more of the Dove's Plain Flour Blend. Put the cracker dough onto the piece of baking parchment, cover it thoroughly in flour, and I'm going to get another piece of baking parchment and cover it with that. I'm going to use my hands to press it down flat a bit, and then I'm going to get a rolling pin and start rolling it out. Now, the thinner you can get this, the better. So you're aiming for only a couple of millimeters thick. The thing about rolling out pastries or doughs between baking parchment is that you can help stop a lot of the sticking that tends to happen with gluten-free baked products. So I've just lifted my baking parchment off there to put a little bit more flour on. And I've got it pretty thin now and fairly evenly rolled out. You want to aim, as I said, for about a couple of millimetres. And now what you want is a cutter. It's nice if you can get a square one. Today I've got a round one and I'm going to cut circles out of my dough. So this mixture should make about 24 crackers, but that is going to rather depend upon how thin you get your dough. And then I'm going to use a palette knife to lift them off. There we go. And then I'm going to place them on the baking tray, which is lined with a silicon baking liner. Right, so I've now cut out all that I can. So I'm going to squidge the dough together, roll it up again, and repeat until I get all my crackers cut out of the piece of dough. They're going to now go into the oven for about 10 minutes, come out, cool down, and go back into the oven for another few minutes, and that's what helps them be really crispy. They're really delicious with cheese, and they work really well just as a nibble to have with a drink. It's really nice to be able to make your own gluten-free crackers rather than have to go and buy them. G Free Radio at hotmail.com, gfreeradio.com, and also on Twitter at G Free Radio. Tell you what's coming up in next week's show in a few moments' time. First of all, our tweets of the week. So let's uh, we kind of do this live. So looking down some of the uh, some of the items that we favourited over the last seven days or so. Jane's gluten free on Twitter. If you're not following at G Free Radio, you should give it a try. Good info. I oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I love his sauciness, says Jane's gluten-free. Jane, you've called me saucy. You won't mind if I'm going to look at your biog picked. Oh, hello. Uh, who's, the, who's, the, who's the guy? You're, 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 you're accepting an award, Jane. You're, Jane is pictured at an award ceremony in her LBD uh, next to a, uh, a, a, a dashing chap in a full tux. And Jane is holding a certificate um, and... Let's zoom in. It is Canadian Independent Grocer of the Year 2013 Award of Merit. Jane, congratulations. Congratulations indeed. That's great stuff. Uh, OK, I uh, got a little sidelined there. Um, also, um, what else have we got here? 
Um, this is really quite, you know, there's, there's such a variety on Twitter. And some of them are, are, are really quite sassy. Some of them are saucy. Um, some of them are rude. Um, some of them are really poignant. Some of them get straight to the heart of the matter. Uh, decide for yourself which category this one fits in. Becca Karin said, um, and I'm going, I'm, I'm only hesitating because I'm going to slightly edit this in case you are, you have sensitive ears. Um, uh, next person to post a gluten sensitivity is bull post. I'm going to buy some bread and sit in your house and eat it. <laughs> we love that. We love that. That is really, really good. Um, also, we've got here, uh, Hello Good Pie. What a great name. Hello Good Pie. Uh, on Twitter, not to blow our own trumpet, uh, but we make delicious pies. And G Free Radio, what a great idea. Um, so uh, that they, they've, they've, uh, they, they make these um, at the Thursday Street Food Market in uh, Mark Thalle Nian. Where is that? Whereabouts are these guys based? This is in Berlin. Hello, if you're listening to us, if one of your 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 are uh, a uh, uh, German contingent. Hello, uh, Guten Tag, Gluten Tag. Uh, you're welcome along. Um, also, we've got something here. Jason, uh, Jason of Sam says. Uh, now you've got to bear in mind that Target, if you're not in the US of A, Target is a, a slightly cheaper store, isn't it? A slightly cheaper supermarket. Jason says, I make too much money to be seen at Target, but not enough to have a gluten intolerance. You know what? We understand where you're coming from here. Understand where you're coming from. Um, Emma Butler on Twitter. She's Brighton underscore foodie. So follow her if you want to see her, quote, great selection of gluten-free restaurants in Brighton and Hove. Uh, William Paul Roberts, coffee addict WPR, says, when I eat something labelled gluten-free, I always get a feeling I must be missing out on something. And Delilah Edge at D underscore C Talk, DC Talk, says, do you ever have one of those days where you feel like rubbish and can't figure out where you came in contact with gluten? Yeah, yeah, we do have those. And you think to yourself, or am I just feeling rubbish anyway for a completely different reason? And also, let's finish on this one. Emily Kimber, uh, Emily J. Kimber says, so a supermarket thinks it's acceptable to replace your gluten-free food with regular food in your delivery because... They didn't have it in stock. Well, F you, says Emily. We know where you're coming from. Next week on the G Free Radio Show and our next episode for your listening pleasure. And uh, we speak to someone who's got, got to speak to two intriguing people. First of all, we're going to be hearing from someone who has written a recipe book for people who live G free. Now, before you think to yourself, yeah, you know what? I've got recipe books coming out of my ears. I think it's one of the few times that we've spoken to someone who has written a recipe book because we don't tend to do that because there are so many of them and it would rather be like opening up the floodgate. But uh, we reckon there's an interesting story uh, that has to be told here. And we're going to be hearing um, about that interesting story from the person whose story it is. So Kate Hardy is our guest in next week's programme. And also we're going to be hearing from Inda. Now, Inda is um, someone from India. Uh, at least uh, her heritage is Indian, and she has a daughter, and she has to live gluten-free. So what's it like growing up in the UK with that Indian heritage background, with the food that you would like to eat, because that is part of your history, your culture? How easy is it to find the information you need, perhaps referring to some slightly older generations, who have perhaps a language difficulty um, when they go to health professionals in the UK? How easy, how easy is it living as a celiac in the UK, 
if you are from the Indian subcon- sub- subcontinent. Uh, we've got two intriguing stories, two fantastic stories. Please don't miss them, uh, because otherwise, uh, miss them. You will be missing out on a little bit more information that will help you live your celiac life a little bit easier. OK, that's about it from me. I hope you've had a fantastic seven days. I hope your next seven days are just as brilliant, if not better. Look after yourself. Live G-Free. Be healthy and happy. And I'll speak with you soon. Don't forget to get in touch with us. G-Free Radio, hotmail.com. was the G Free Radio Show with Peter Stewart and you. Thanks for listening. And remember, until next time, be good, be healthy, and be G Free.